I thought that if we combine those elements with our our cinematic sensibility, we could have something that was really special, something that was really beautiful. And ten years later, uh, we finally finished the film, and that, that is, I think, that's not an unusual story. That adapting something from a, a literary material into a film is a challenge because it's often often an exercise of ruthless economy, taking something that's 550 pages and distilling that down to 90 minutes. It's a trick. You have to find the emotional core of it, and that takes a, a good long while. Um, let's talk quickly about uh, the fact that Leica is this amazing studio. I can't think of too many others uh, that, are, that are doing what you do, which is full-length feature stop-motion animation. Um, let's talk about that as well. I mean, I guess uh, it's a silly question because I know I love stop-motion, but why? I mean, where does it come from for, for you, Travis? I know that you're passionate about this yeah, um, stop motion is undoubtedly the worst possible way to make a movie. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> Every single day I ask, why the hell are we doing this? This makes no sense. I mean, the pace is glacial. Yeah, an animator will, well, you probably saw that, got a sense of it in that last clip by how many different shirts I was wearing. That, that took me two weeks to shoot that last shot there. It's, on a given week, a good animator can produce anywhere from four to five seconds of footage a week. It's ridiculous. Um, and yet, there is something about the process that I think is undoubtedly beautiful and charming. It's, it's, oh, yeah. It has a timeless quality, and it, it really goes back to the dawn of film. When, uh, when Georges Méliès was sending rockets to the moon, this is the kind of special effects they were doing a hundred years ago. And it's, it was rooted in stage magicians trying to find new ways to bring their illusions to life. And I think <clears throat> stop motion has that dusting of magic. It's timeless. It's, 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 the, it goes to, it's one of the very first visual effects ever developed for film. And so, you know, it is a bit anachronistic, though, because everything is done digitally, everything is done with computers now, and so when we started Leica, we tried to figure out how we could take this beautiful medium and bring it into a new era, and we did that by combining craft with technology, and, you know, all the different things from rapid prototyping, to digital capture systems, to 3D stereoscopic photography, it's all in an effort to take this incredible handcrafted media and bring it into a new era, and that's what we've done uh, for these three films. Um. Uh, Graham and Tony, um, you guys have been involved with CG and with, uh, with hand drawing, I believe, uh, in your past. I mean, uh, now you're doing stop motion. I mean, can you give us some, you know, how does that, what's the difference? Uh, it was a huge mistake. Um, I'm like five years old. I didn't look like this when I started this part. I started my career as a traditional animator, so it was all hand drawn. Um, so I came from a place of of creating the art by hand. And since then, you know, the, the industry has changed, the different CG films, and both in front of the camera and behind, you know, working on a stop motion film is so different. You know, working on a CG film, you know, you're in big dark rooms with computer screens. If you squint your eyes, you might as well be working in a bank. Uh, but when you walk into Leica, it feels like you're walking into an old movie studio from the 30s or 40s. There's a costume department, there's a carpentry department. Real things are being built every day, and you walk out to the set where there's lighters lighting it, just like they did, like Grant, you know, Trav said, at the, the dawn of cinema. That's really satisfying, and I think what that gives you is something intangible. There's an aura to the look of stop motion that, you know, when I was a kid and I saw the original King Kong or anything by Ray Harryhausen, there was something, you know, there were adventure movies, there was tons of adventure movies, but these moments, these stop motion moments, had this dreamlike quality to them, this weird, strange thing that I think is really unique, especially today, like Scott said, where we're surrounded by pixels and things that don't really exist in the real world. And, you know, for me, I, I just believe that there's something, even if people only know it subconsciously, that everybody remembers as a child playing with a doll or playing with a model train set or playing with a truck and moving it around yourself. And there's something in here that goes deep into the DNA, that people know these things really exist and that they're handcrafted and that there's real light on real fabric. And that adds a certain quality to them that, that is rare in, in our world today. I think between you know the different forms of animation, stop motion is definitely the most high pressure commitment up front form of it because in you know two D hand drawn or CG it's always very iterative and certainly as a director you can always keep coming in and saying you know let's pull these drawings out you can always look at the whole thing and kind of continue to hone it and, and refine it. Stop motion I think is much more akin to theater 
I think, I can only presume I don't work in theater, but it all comes down to this intense conversation with the animator before they go up to do that shot. And you have to remember every single little thing, every detail that's going to have to get communicated has to show up in that conversation then. And then they walk out and you get the shot you're going to get forevermore in the film. And I mean, Tony and I have described it as the shooting schedule lasted for 18 months. It was 18 months of opening night every day, it felt like. You know, um, it's, it's still hard if you haven't visited a, a, an animation studio like this, and, and really few of us have, but um, it's, it is like, like you said, like a miniature Hollywood old studio where they've got like how many sets? How many different uh, we had, sets? We had 79 different locations and plus the 60 different sets were built right. for the movie in one giant warehouse in the woods <laughs> outside of Portland. <laughs> And it's the just, woods. It, I'm again watching it this time for the third or fourth time, uh, sitting in the back, and I, I keep looking at it from different angles. That the the art direction is just jaw dropping in this film, and to think that every shot, I'm just gushing for a moment, so clearly, uh -huh. every shot is just so gorgeous and, 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 and so well directed, and then every little hat and glove and everything that you see is a manufactured physical piece is just kind of mind-blowing to uh, to us out here. Yeah, there's a lot of unsung craftsmen here. And, and, and it's actually great that we forget that that's what it takes, because we're watching the story, and we're watching the characters, and we're watching the acting, and I guess I'm going to have to go over to the actors here and uh, to tell us about that. I mean, I, again, I was watching it this time, knowing that you guys were going to be here, and that, that the uh, uh, the acting, both the vocally and, even, and the acting of the ca characters was, was wonderful. It was, it was real, it was, it was, it was you know, uh, <laughs> El, first. you tell us about, uh, I know you have, you've done some voiceover before, haven't you? Yeah, I've done one, but I was very young. Was that, that, was that, Totoro. Right. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, was, um, I was young, so uh, when they asked me, I know about Micah because my sister was the voice of Coraline. So in a weird way, I, and she did that for, she was a voice for like seven years. She was still voicing him. And I remember her, you know, going to do that. And I, I visited the Coraline sets when I was little in Portland with her. So I was very familiar with the family. And so as I got older, then the Bok Trolls came along and they asked me if I wanted to be a part of the family too. And um, of course I said yes, because I just love it. I love dollhouses growing up. Like, I would go, that was my favorite. I just love tiny things. <laughs> and because um, it, it was crazy. I remember when I was little, um, I saw at FAO Schwartz, they have a great dollhouse section, and I saw a tiny little Wonder Bread. It was like bread, you know, like Wonder Bread is, and it had, it looked exactly like the big Wonder Bread, but just small. <laughs> and so, and I always loved that. I always remember that. <laughs> and I'm like, gosh, if they can, these people, they make those little things and out of the craziest materials like you can't even imagine and so um obviously right away i wanted to to do it and play winnie and i just thought that she's the best character also for young girls because you know she's very feisty and kind of not what you would expect because on the outside she's very kind of shirley temple like and sweet you know looking but then she has this power and um in this fire, so I, that was fun to play. I never played someone who was so uh, kind of, you know, direct and slightly bratty. So, um, and, and I enjoyed that, and um, yeah, it was the, just the best experience. And I love the film so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also just, uh, uh, unlike Toto, which was uh, you know, you're dubbing, you're reading somebody else's lines. This is. A performance, and now that you also have a British accent, I believe, in, in the film too. So, did you? How did you study about that? Did you study that, or? Well, we had um, a dialect coach. Tony was there for all my sessions in LA, and um, and Carla, the dialect coach, she helped me. So, you know, we would, me and Tony, would be like, oh yeah, that was great on the emotion side. You know, that was a perfect take, the way it sounded, but then Carla would be in the background, like, no, that word was not English, that was wrong, so we had to do it again, and, um, and yeah, and, and so, um, 
Yeah, and that, that, yeah, that was what happened. I just want to know, also know, when you first saw the film, did you see it in progress, or did you, did you, when you, did you see it when it was all done? And, and what did you think of, of you in the film, the film itself? What did you think of that? Oh, I, I love it. I, and he would bring back, um, Tony, I, the first time I did my, you know, voice, because you don't do it all in one sitting, you have to go back. And, um, we, I didn't have, I had a, some pictures of Winnie. I knew what she would look like, but it also, she wasn't finalized yet. Like that, that wasn't her exact dress or her, the exact hairstyle. So I got a sense of what she looked like, but then each time, each session I'd go in and then, you know, there'd be more pictures and then more, you know, animation that they would just show. This is Winnie's walk and we could get so excited of those, like four seconds of her walking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, that was huge. And, um, and then I think the, the last session I did, there was an actual like statue, like puppet of you know this is her, this is her. I know what she's gonna be. Okay, Sir Ben. Oh boy, that was so good. That was so good. Um, <laughs> I'm down, Jerry. I've been nervous all day. Um, you haven't done, you actually, I looked on IMDb and you did, did do an animated film a bunch of years ago, uh, Freddy the Frog, uh, but that's, forget that. This film is a completely different, is literally a completely different animal. How, you are real, this is a real performance, that's the thing uh, that's really special here, and you're a consummate actor. Tell us about how you, approached this role and got into doing it. Can you talk about that? Well, I think that um, the gentlemen have quite rightly touched on Dickens. And in all of uh, great English literature, you come across what is, some scholars call the heroic villain. Um, and because this story is so dependent upon the survival of basically two orphans, one who doesn't know his father is alive, and the other, um, Ellie's parents, don't see her and don't hear her, and slam the door in her face so often. She's an emotional orphan, in a sense. And that's very Dickensian. And, and for, two, for two orphans, not only to find each other and, and, and bond and find great friendship, but also do a huge service to their community by dispelling the myth of the, of the box fall. And the heroic villain has to be an equal and opposite force against those two little souls for them to triumph. And I think that had you, had you weakened or diluted the dark side of Archibald Snatcher, uh, the children wouldn't have that arc to triumph over. You have to have something for the young hero and heroine to dominate and triumph over, and that was Archibald. So it was a great relish that I understood my, if you like, my, um, my narrative function mm. in the film, which was to bring that, and like a completely unafraid of darkness. And I know that whenever I uh, read stories to my children when they were little, always the scary bits were the ones they'd ask me to read again. <laughs> <laughs> Do they would be right up Right up there. Dad, could you read the scary bit again? <laughs> they love that. They love that tingle of, of being frightened in a safe place. And of course, being, being a little bit scared by Archibald and his cohorts in the safe place, which is a cinema with your parents. It must be a delightful feeling. So all, all those wonderful um, beckoning gestures were made to me by these wonderful gentlemen and I was delighted to accept. And this is a real meaty role, I think. There's a lot. He's the hero of Absolutely, yeah. 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 And then he dresses, dresses up like a woman. Uh, <laughs> his, his sexuality, his, his, also his aspirations to join the club that will not admit him as a member. And he's such a burning social dilemma uh, where that misplaced ambition is so focused on opening a door that will actually be socially close to him uh, because of the White House. And he's determined to be included. So it's a struggle to be included uh, that also damns him and defines him as well. Many layered character, delightful to play. 
I heard you um, uh, recorded it. Uh, somebody told me you were recording it in a special chair or something. Like that. It wasn't a special chair, but they 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 rigged up. They they just it was it was quite a comfortable chair, but it happened to to recline backwards. So I, I eventually decided with uh, with Anthony's wonderful um, um, compliance that I would lie down to record all my lines. Ah. <laughs> it, it restricted physical justice. See, I'm doing it now. I'm emphasizing what I'm doing with my hands. That's useless to an animator. I can jump up and down and wave my arms. The best thing for me to give the animator the best shot was to be completely still and let it all come through the voice. And I really enjoyed the most extraordinary sounds. I didn't know they were in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the more I stretched, vowel sounds almost beyond recognition. <laughs> Tony would hop up and down and say, that's just what the animators love. And I was so delighted that Ellie's character repeats my phrase all the way. <laughs> and she would be around, you know. That's so lovely. Complete that line if you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even lying down. I wasn't even lying down. That's right, you did that sitting up. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, did you, how long did you take, how many times, how many sessions did you have? With I think we had, we said there was only going to be six, but it turned out to be eight. I think we had eight, eight recording sessions. Uh, mostly in, you were kind of to come to Oxfordshire, where yeah. I live. Yeah. And then I, I think I did one, 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 one big one in Los Angeles <laughs> at the end to finish it out. And then we did, and some singing? Yeah, we did yeah. the big singing one so we could get the version of the song. Right. right. It was four hours long doing that voice the whole time. What were those special lozenges you used? The fish they are fishermen's, the fishermen's friends. Oh, yeah. I am sponsored by them. I'm wearing their t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's Sir Ben, do you, you, were you aware of the Micah's uh, films before and the things that they do? I just want to, uh, you know, I mean, I, the finished result, we all know, we see it's great. I mean, did you did you pre-visualize or know this? Yes. I, I, I wasn't as closely related to them, like a second cousin that Ellie was when she joined. Uh, I was a, a new boy, but I had seen Coraline and loved it, and knew their work. And also, we were just discussing um, earlier on, the chaps and I, uh, an ancient Burmese technique uh, with shadow puppets, and they were two-dimensional, behind a white lit screen and you couldn't see the puppets operating but they were too, they worked off sticks. The sticks moved the limbs and they were very simple and very beautiful, very compelling. I saw them on TV as a child. And um, I, I, I love the the handmade quality of their work. There's no way around it. You can you can tell that you're watching something made by human beings. And it gives it that in our DNA, our mirror neurons, if you want to call them, we, we recognize that we are being told a story by a fellow human being. And that's, uh, that, there's no substitute for that. I totally agree. Uh, I do want to throw it open to uh, questions if you have them. I know it always takes a while for us to get one. Uh, well, that's not going to be the case this time. I'm just going to. All right. Um, you write in the center. Oh, we'll get Hi, I was wondering if you had any particular instances you could tell us about that you found yourself needing to experiment and try something new and whether or not you weren't sure if it would work out, if you could tell us about anything like that. Who are you addressing that to? Um, the animators especially, but if the actors think of anything, I'd like to hear that too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you don't know any of it's going to work. <laughs> you start out at the beginning, and if you, if you were to, to think about all the choices, all the decisions, all the tiny little things that you have to do over the course of the film to make the movie, you would be defeated instantly. It's, it's ridiculous. You have to take it a little chunk at a time. And, but the thing is, you always have to be, you know, for, for, for Graham and Tony and me, we always have to think of the big picture as well. And so knowing where to put our resources, where to focus our energies. 
But there were certain things that, that you know, initially you would think that, oh, yeah, we know that's going to be difficult. We know a big battle scene means this big monster. Yeah, and he ends up having a tea party with Winnie and Winnie's parents, and it's really awkward and uncomfortable. And that was great, very easy to do, but it didn't feel big enough when we reviewed the reels. So we decided that he should come into the middle of a ballroom dancing sequence. And we were like, great idea, high five, we're so smart. It turned out to be the most difficult sequence to do. We have, for every sequence in the film, we have a breakdown meeting where we have all the heads of the department come together in the same room and we all discuss shot by shot how we're going to handle each piece of the film. The meetings are really boisterous and everybody's kind of pumped up. There's a lot of espresso and coffee and cookies. It's always a very exciting time in the afternoon. When we walked into the uh, breakdown meeting for the ballroom sequence, it was completely quiet. No one was talking. Nobody made eye contact with us when we did it. It's like the moment where we realized that we may may have overstepped our limits. But uh, mm -hmm. we ended up figuring it out. And that's part of the great culture there is there. Like it is that, you know, when a few times where I said, Travis, I don't know if we're going to do that, Travis was that's what we do here. You know, there's a lot of amazing craftsmen there, and they'll figure out a way to do everything you can ask of them. So it took 18 months to do a little less than two minutes of the ball on the end. <laughs> it's a testament to the team. They figure out how to do anything. We throw any challenge at those guys, and they are absolutely brilliant. And you know, it's specific things, things like, okay, we need to come up with a really graphic hairstyle for this character, mm -hmm. something you wouldn't think would be difficult. Well, you know, making a wig, a little tiny wig, can be very challenging if you're trying to find a design that fits with the overall aesthetic for the film. So we end up using, you know, natural fibers, things like raffia or hemp. There's a lot of hemp. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said they use it for. I <laughs> to Washington State for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> but it's to say, all the little choices that you have to make every single step along the way, none of this stuff exists before we start. Everything has to be designed, built, and manipulated by an artist's hand. Every single thing is a choice. And so when you, when you think about that on, on this kind of scale, it's really mind-blowing that any of it even remotely works. But uh, when it comes together so beautifully like it did in the film, it's, it's, really, it's really inspiring for us to be a part of that team. Well, the gentlemen have not mentioned that I found of course, obvious, but then extraordinary at the same time. That dance is choreographed by a choreographer. So, I mean, did you have real dancers and then... Yes, yeah, we filmed it with uh, a team of real dancers. Yeah. Choreographed the waltz. Shot it as reference. And shot it, and then the yeah. puppets imitated it. That's extraordinary. <laughs> Speaking of uh, hand handcrafted, and uh, I want to give a quick shout out. Icing on the cake in the film is the uh, hand drawn uh, end titles. I just want to say thank you for that too. I mean, just another little touch that makes it really, really great. We have a question over here. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to stand up because you can't see me if I'm sitting. Um, it's actually a question for the whole panel, and it has to do with your interactions as actors. Okay with other actors and your response to the way you got the dialogue. In other words, like chicken and egg, which came first or in what order or did it bounce back and forth? Well, Mom, I didn't meet my <laughs> wonderful team of cohorts until we were at the screening, public screening. I did all my dialogue apart from one half day with, 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 uh, with, with, with Isaac Hempstead. Yeah, right. one half day with Isaac. I never saw the, the guys that work with Snatcher until we met at screening. So the rhythm of our interaction and the ch ch choice of inflections and then response with an inflection is entirely due to the editors and the animators. Uh, we, they, they took those literally separate components and put them together and it looks as though as a team of henchmen, we rehearsed together for months. We didn't. It was entirely encapsulated in each tape and then beautifully put together musically, I think. Musically, um, someone, someone in the edit has a sublime musical ear because the, the duets and the quartets that played out between actors and trios are as if they're singing together in the same room. Yeah, I mean, you try as much as you can to, to get the actors together, but because, you know, we, we shoot this thing over a course of two years and people are, are spread all across the world, it becomes hard to schedule those things. And so, 
you know, we, we you know, we take, you know, whatever we can get. Uh, you know, you do get an interaction when you have actors sitting in a room that you wouldn't if you have an actor on their on their own. But I think it's it's an incredible incredible testament to the abilities of, of our acting team that they were they were able to create those performances with with just us knuckleheads sitting around mm -hmm. that they in their they had nothing but their imagination and their voice and they were able to, to, to create these incredible performances that are by turns menacing and vulnerable and moving and that's what extraordinary actors give you and that's what we have in this film. Yeah one thing I'm one sorry off you oh, no one of the things um, you know, so then recorded alone, without even a reader reading the lines against him. And one of the things that was a little unique to the way that we worked together is that you would do three takes of every line from the very beginning of the moment. So you, you, you know, I could always tell you came prepared, you came with an idea and stuff. But each one of the three takes would be slightly different. So in a scene like where you had Portly Ryan and Snatcher on the stairway, where it's a little bit of a tango, a little bit of a battle back and forth trying to pass him on the stairway, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different ways to play each line. <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to play each line. And so in those first three that you would do, one would be it would be um, you're trying to convince him or you're confronting him, and then one would be you're begging him. The hardest thing to preserve in animation is a little bit of improvisation and spontaneity. So you try to force that spontaneity to happen mechanically by getting subtly different readings. And so it takes a lot of patience from, from the actors and a lot of trust when you're telling them, well, you hate this guy and you're trying to get past him on the stairs, confront him. And then you get three lines of a confrontational take. And then you go, now begging. You know, and I was always glad that, that Sherben never said, well, wait a minute, what do you want here? Because what I would say was, I, when I get all these things together, it's like playing an instrument, I can play that scene in slightly different ways, and I'll do the same thing with Jared Harris. And you could use your voice like a musical instrument and just do such subtle variations. And as long as I could come up with a playable direction, you know, something that made sense, you would give me these unique takes, and then we would literally spend hours in the editing room with Edie and say, let's try one where he's more confrontational, and then let's see a little bit of that empathy where he's starting to get break down and he's begging and stuff. So that's a lot of work to do in four hours for, for one scene. And sometimes we did 20, 30 takes of individual lines of a thing. So it's, it's a lot of patience on everybody's part and stuff. But without that, you can't get that feeling of the actors are together in the room reacting to each other. I'm going to quote Miss Fanning mm -hmm. uh, at a press conference and she, where she said something that I find very amusing and a little bit startling. When asked what was it like to work alone, she said it was wonderful. There were no other actors. <laughs> consideration, of course, I interpreted exactly what she meant. <laughs> that it is an extraordinary acting exercise, and you're parachuted into a certain set of conditions, and if you're alert to your craft, you, you take, you get the very best out of that bizarre opportunity. So to do, to, do, to give you three versions of one line that may be four words long, is for me a terrific acting exercise, and for L2 it's 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 a great acting challenge. So it wasn't it was patience didn't come in. It was an absolute joy. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have another question over here. Yeah. Actually, I have um well, it's not. I have um, kind of one and a half questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, Elle, I loved you in Maleficent, I loved you in this movie, you're awesome. Mr. Uh, Sir King, Sir Ben Kingsley, I loved you in everything, <laughs> including Iron Man 3 and stuff. But I have a technical question for the animators. Um, I know that when you shoot animation, uh, stop motion or hand-drawn, that animation is shot at 24 frames per second. I noticed that your guys' animation is like super, super smooth. Do you shoot one shot per movement or two shots per movement? And that's one question. And also, on behalf of my niece here, how do you, how would one uh, get into doing animation, whether it's CGI animation, stop motion, like what's a good start for someone getting into animation? Come to it. No <laughs> 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 way. So yeah, I mean, the film, traditionally film is 24 frames a second. Uh, some 
Uh, you know, traditionally in, in animation, you could get by doing 12 frames a second, so you know, two two drawings or two exposures for you know until you're sh essentially shooting on doubles. Uh, like when we shoot everything on singles, so 24 frames a second, it looks smooth because we're that damn good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in terms of animation, you know, it's it's funny. I grew up in a farm town in Oregon, and there were no animation schools. The internet didn't exist as a resource. Can you believe it? it was a long before the internet. So I mean, so my story for animators of my generation is pretty much the same as, as all the anim animators that worked on this film. Is that we all kind of work on our own in these little pockets. We really love the craft. We want to figure out how to do it. So you do your own research, but nothing beats the doing. If you're interested in doing it, you have to do it. And you've got to put your heart and soul into it. And you learn things, you get better. I mean, my first animation experience were horrible. They were just disasters. I'm sure it was the same with these guys too. But you learn things, you figure it out. And, and then when you find pockets, little community with people who have like-minded interests, you share ideas. Now with the internet, it's really easy. You can find a lot of that stuff and those things. That information exists as a resource, um, but there's nothing that beats the doing of it, which is why with, with every film that we put out, we always try to put, put supplemental materials out there. This is how we did it, so people will get inspired to, if they're so inclined, if there's something a little wonky in their DNA and want to try yeah. this, this is how we did this. How did you do the smoke and fire effects, though? The trade yeah. secret. Right from the Which she did. <laughs> you know, it's really a hybrid film. You know, there's probably not a shot in the film that doesn't have some sort of CG embellishment, whether it's adding atmosphere or extending the sets to the horizon and stuff. So we actually researched the look of the fire in traditional ways using cheesecloth and colored gels and ripple glass and cotton and stuff to figure out what did the flames look like in the style of our film? And then we use them inside the mecha drill when it's walking around. There's an iPad behind the, the teeth of the mouth. And playing on the iPad a single frame at a time is that footage that we made. And then, because we wanted flames licking out of the mouth and stuff, we also had some CG embellishment on there. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more question. And where's our mic people? So who's going to get it? Okay, yeah, we got my person on the side. So. Hi, I, I did want to say I actually saw the video of how you did the cheesecloth behind the plexiglass. It was amazing. Um, I love the film. And uh, I wanted to know how you find the talent for uh, fabrication and set work and uh, what you would suggest to someone wanting to get involved in the next film? Well, it's, I mean, we scour the planet for people that are just really good craftspeople because, yeah, I mean, the, the amount of people that actually do stop motion for a living, I mean, it's like, in, in this entire world, there's like 200 maybe. It's like there's nobody does this kind of stuff for good reason. <laughs> so if, if we're trying to make a film that requires, you know, a, a team of, of 300 people, we have to scour the planet for them, which is why we really have an international crew at the studio. They're from all over the world. And, and then for other things, we have to train them. So we'll find people who are really good at using their hands, like ceramics or who are seamstresses or who do uh, jewelry making or watch making. Or that's just really intricate, detailed stuff with their hands. And then if you, you know, take their perspective and just shift it slightly, they can be extraordinary stop motion artists. And so that's, that's kind of been our process. We find people who are really good artists and then you can kind of tweak their perspective and they can be incredible animators. So, uh, you know, that's really the thing is you've got to have that mind, that mentality, that ability to focus intensely for long periods of time on one mind numbing thing. And uh, if you're passionate about that, you can be a great stop motion animator. <laughs> <laughs> Huzzah! <laughs> that's my, that's my okay. That's our panel. Um, like up, box trolls. Wow. Thank yeah. you, Graham Annabel. Thank you to Scott Lee, Travis Knight, Al Fanny, and Sir Pam Kinsley.